There's an outline of the message in the back page of your bulletin if you'd like to follow along. As Mark indicated, we're going to be talking this morning about this meal that we partake in together. Next week, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be celebrating our church's 186th anniversary. Think about the number of communion services that we have celebrated together as a church family over the years. Hundreds upon hundreds of them. And things have changed over the last 186 years. 186 years ago, I would be willing to bet that most people who are celebrating this meal would on Saturday be preparing themselves spiritually for it. And if there was anyone with whom they were having conflict, they would seek to resolve it before Sunday morning. If there was any unconfessed sin in their lives, they would try to confess it before then. And then on Sunday they would gather and celebrate this meal as a joyous uh, time of thanksgiving to God for what he's done for us. My, how things have changed. You know what happens oftentimes. We come into church on Sunday mornings. We see the white tablecloth. We see the communion elements. And we think to ourselves, oh man, everyone's going to get to Swiss chalet before I do today. We all do that. But is that what the Lord's Supper is all about? What is it that we're doing here? Today I want us to, no matter how many times you've celebrated the Lord's Supper in the past, I want you, I want us together to take a fresh look at this meal and ask ourselves, remind ourselves why it is we do what we do. It's known by many names. Some call it the Lord's Supper. Some call it communion. Some call it the Eucharist. It's known by many different names. Many of us, as I indicated, have participated hundreds of times in this ritual. Its roots go back 3,500 years. It was instituted by Christ himself as a symbol of our unity. Yet over the years, it has been the source of a great deal of conflict. Countless men and women and children have been persecuted, executed, and threatened with the fires of eternal damnation because of their views around this meal. Yet today, as I said, it's largely misunderstood and neglected. Why do we do this meal? Let's look at it afresh. As I said, Baptists recognize what we call two ordinances. An ordinance is something that was ordered or commanded by Christ. One is baptism, that we normally only do once in our lives. And the other is the Lord's Supper, which we practice over and over again. Now we use the term, most often as Baptists, we use the term Lord's Supper to describe this meal. We do it because it reminds us that this is not our table. It's not our meal. This table belongs to Jesus Christ. It's he who issues the invitation to partake of the meal. And he invites all those who love him and who desire to serve him to partake of this meal. You don't have to be a member of First Baptist Church. You don't even have to be a Baptist. As I said, it is Jesus himself who issues the invitation. The roots for this meal go back all the way to the book of Exodus. Do you remember when Moses stood before Pharaoh when his people were, at, were in slavery in Egypt? And he kept saying to Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh kept refusing, and God, through Moses, brought all of these plagues, plagues before, the pe before the king and the people of Egypt. 
But over and over and over again, the Pharaoh of Egypt refused to let the people go. And finally, God said, I'm going to do one more thing to Egypt, and then they will let you go. And he said, I will send my angel of death, and he will kill the firstborn sons in all of the Egyptian homes. After that, they will let you go. And so Moses instructed the Israelites to go into their homes to take blood from a lamb and wipe it on the doorposts. And then when the angel of death went over the land, killing the firstborn in the Egyptian homes, he would see the blood on the doorposts and he would pass over those homes. And that's why, to this day, Jewish people celebrate Passover because the angel of death passed over the Jewish homes. Well, Jesus was Jewish. And because Passover was normally celebrated in homes rather than in a synagogue, when he was in Jerusalem for that last Passover, just hours before his arrest and trial and crucifixion, he needed to find a place to celebrate this important Jewish feast with his disciples. Legend tells us that the mother of one of Jesus' followers, John Mark, who incidentally later on wrote the Gospel of Mark, the earliest Gospel, the mother of John Mark made an upper room a second floor room, an upper room available to Jesus and his disciples for this meal. And this is where on that Thursday that we call Maundy Thursday, this is where Jesus and his disciples gathered for this meal. I could preach a year of sermons on everything that happened that evening in that upper room. It was there that Jesus wrapped a towel around himself and washed his disciples' feet in order to show them what true servanthood is. It was there that he reminded them that he was going to, in just a few hours, die for them and how much he loved them. It was there that he warned them of one who was going to betray him and another who would deny him. It was there that he said that he was going to go away, but not to worry, that he would come again and take them to his father's house with its many mansions. It was there that he promised to send them the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, who when he came would lead them into all truth. All this took place on that special Thursday evening. And then when Jesus had done all of this, he paused. And he looked out over that motley crew of disciples and his heart went out to them. There was only one thing left for him to do before they left the upper room before they went to the Garden of Gethsemane, to the Mount of Olives, where Jesus would pray, where he would be betrayed, where he would be put on trial and then executed. That one last thing was something that his disciples continued to do for the rest of their lives. It's something that we have done in this church hundreds of times, and it's something that we're going to do this morning. And the Apostle Paul, through direct revelation from Jesus Christ, learned about this magnificent ritual that we're going to perform. And Paul told the Corinthian Christians about it. What did he say? He told them, I received from the Lord that which I also made known to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Eat this in remembrance of of me. And then Paul goes on to say that in a similar manner, Jesus also took the cup, saying, 
This cup is the new covenant, the new agreement in my blood. Do this, he said, as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Why did Jesus do this with his disciples? Why did he command that we follow that example? Why have we continued to do it for 2,000 years? Why has this church done it on a regular basis for 186 years? There's all kinds of reasons, but this morning, I'm going to highlight just two. Just two. The first one is we celebrate the Lord's Supper as a memorial. We're giving thanks to Jesus Christ for what he's done for us. We're reminding ourselves that his body was broken for us. His blood was poured out for us. Make no mistake about it. There is nothing that we can do as believers that is more personal, more intimate than this meal. Every time we eat and drink of it, we are saying, Lord Jesus, your body was given for me. Your blood was poured out for me. You died for me. And we're saying, thank you. Thank you. Robert Coleman has written a book called Written in Blood. And in it he tells a story, a true story, of a little girl who came down with a very rare and deadly disease. And she was continuing to deteriorate despite the doctor's best efforts. And they finally came to the conclusion that the only way that her life was going to be saved is if she received a blood transfusion from someone who had previously had this disease and had recovered from it. The problem was it was a rare disease, and to make things worse, she had a very rare blood type. But her parents remembered that her older brother had also had the disease and he had the same blood type that his sister had, which made her the perfect candidate and so that made him the perfect candidate. So the doctor sat down with his little boy and explained that his sister was dying and the only way to save her life was if he gave her a blood transfusion. And when they explained this to him, his lower lip kind of quivered a little bit. He paused, and then he said, Doctor, if it'll save my sister's life, I'll do anything. And so they very quickly wheeled this little girl in, and she was small and frail and wan and white and pale. And they wheeled up her brother next to him, and he was strong and robust and tanned. And they put a little uh, uh, transfusion between the two of them, the two between the two of them, and they began to transfuse his blood into her. And he looked over at his sister and he gave her a smile, and then he became very serious. And after about five minutes, he called the doctor over to him and he said, Doctor, I was just wondering, how long before I die? See, this little boy hadn't understood what a blood transfusion was. He thought that by giving his blood, he was going to die. And in that moment, when his lower lip quivered, he made the epic decision that he would die for his sister. You and I, like that little girl, we have a disease. And that disease is called sin. And the only one who could save us, the only one who could die for us, was Jesus. But it took more than just a blood transfusion. It took his very life. It took him allowing his body to be given up for us. It took him allowing his blood to be poured out for us. When we partake of this meal, we are saying, Lord Jesus, thank you. Someone, anonymous author, has written what it is that Jesus has done for us. And listen to these words. 
And this is why we give thanks. He wrote, Jesus became poor that we might become rich. Jesus was born into poverty that we might be born into the kingdom of God. He had no place to lay his head that we might dwell in his house of many mansions. He tasted the cup of our woes and sufferings that we might drink the cup of his fullness and joy. He was silent before Pontius Pilate that we might have his name to speak before the judgment seat of God. He wore a crown of thorns and reigned from a cross that we might wear a crown of glory and reign from a throne. When we partake of this meal, we are saying thank you. Now there's another side to this supper that I want us to look at very briefly as well. Just as Jesus offered himself up as a sacrifice for us, the Lord's Supper symbolizes our willingness to offer our lives as a sacrifice for him. So we're not just reminding ourselves that Jesus sacrificed his life for us. We're saying, Lord, in return, I want my life to be a sacrifice for you. That's why Paul wrote to the Romans in chapter 12, verse 1. He said, with eyes wide open to the mercies of God. In other words, with a full understanding, with a complete awareness of what God's done for you. With eyes wide open. To the mercies of God, I beg you, my brothers, as an act of intelligent worship, to give him your bodies as a living sacrifice, consecrated to him and acceptable by him. This is what the Lord's Supper is all about. We come together and we say, Lord, thank you for dying for me. I can never repay that, but I will do what I can do, and what I can do is offer my life as a sacrifice to you. What does it mean to be a living sacrifice? John Holt has written this. He said, "Being offering ourselves as a living sacrifice, it means giving when you feel like keeping. It means praying for others when you need to be prayed for yourself. It means feeding others when your own soul is hungry. It means living truth before people even when you can't see results. It means hurting with other people even when your own hurt can't be spoken. It means keeping your word even when it's not convenient. It means being faithful even when you want to run away. Years ago, when I was pastoring in Pennsylvania, I was driving up uh, Lancaster Avenue one day, and I saw one of the most respected New Testament scholars who at the time was teaching at Eastern Seminary, absolutely brilliant New Testament scholar, and he was walking up the street with, two, with a bag of groceries in each hand. And I pulled over and asked if he could use a drive, and he seemed very grateful and said, thank you, these are getting kind of heavy. And uh, so I picked him up and drove him home, and he looked over at me with a little smile on his face, and he said, I suppose you're wondering why I'm walking instead of driving. And I said, well, no, that's fine. He said, well, he said, I'll, I'll tell you. He said, I keep saving up for a car, but every time I get enough to buy a car, I feel God calling me to use that money to buy commentaries for Christians in Africa. He said, I'm still saving up for my car. I'll tell you, it was one humble pastor who arrived back at his home that day. That's what it means to be a living sacrifice. Some of you may have heard the name James Calvert. 
He was the leader of a group of missionaries who went to the Fiji Islands many years ago, back when there were cannibals on the Fiji Islands. And when this group of missionaries arrived, the captain of the ship did everything he could to dissuade them from getting off the ship. He said, if you go among those heathen, he said, you and everyone with you will die. And Calvert got a little smile on his face and he said, you know, sir, what you said may be absolutely true, but you forget one thing. We've already died. That's what it means to be a living sacrifice. In just a moment, we're going to partake of this meal together. I invite, or I should say Jesus invites, all those who love him, who desire to be a living sacrifice, to partake of this meal. As we partake of it, I encourage you to give thanks to God Say, thank you, Lord, for this sacrifice that you've made for me, and I offer my life as a sacrifice to you.